All right, welcome again to this month's edition of uh, Africa Liberty webinar. My name is Ibrahim Baba Tunde Anoba, and I am the managing editor here at Africa Liberty. As usual, uh, in each month's edition, we try to look at a burning topic in, in Africa and uh, try to also have uh, experts help us understand what that topic means and uh, its consequence on the continent, and if it's a problem, potentially how we can solve them. And this one's uh, edition is one of such problematic questions, insecurity and truth. What is the correlation between the two? And if at all, there is a correlation, how can we use truth to solve insecurity problems? And to help us understand uh, what we can do uh, are two uh, scholars. First is Dr. Michael Onwapa. Uh, he is an associate fellow at the Royal United Service Institute and the founding director of research at the Center for African Conflicts and Development in London. He holds a PhD in sociology from the University of Roehampton and held two prestigious fellowships at the Baker Institute for Public Policy at Rice University and at the National Consortium for the Study of Terrorism and Responses to Terrorism at the University of Maryland. Dr. Umwakwa's research areas are the nexus between conflict and development, counterinsurgency, counterterrorism, foreign and security policy, and African security. Welcome, Dr. Umwakwa. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you very much. Awesome. Uh, and our second guest is uh, Dr. Alaza Melikamu, who is a lecturer at Jigjiga University in Ethiopia. He holds a Master's of Arts in Peace Studies and Conflict Resolution from the Institute for Peace mm -hmm. and Security Studies at Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. He's an author and co-author with work appearances in national and international journals, including the International Journal of Peace and Development Studies. His research work areas focuses on conflict detection and resolution, unemployment, African continental free trade area, and the security sector governance, among many others. Uh, welcome. So it's welcome. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, so let's just jump straight into it. And um, we we are seeing currently the, the, the situation happening in Sudan as a classic example of how conflicts, uh, political crisis in one country could cause uh, economic consequences or have economic consequences for neighboring countries. So even though the civil war is happening in Sudan, we are seeing reports that Chad, Ethiopia, and even some part of Northern Nigeria are uh, feeling the economic brunt. So if you want to please help us um, restate uh, the connection between security or insecurity and trade, uh, Dr. Nwakba, could you please do that uh, briefly so our audience can have a background knowledge of why these two uh, could be connected? Uh, well, um, there is no doubt that we live in, in a world that is so integrated and you know globalization has brought the world and I say the world is a global village so that means uh, any incident that occurs in any part of the world um, has reverberates beyond uh, the borders of that world so even though we might have um, physical borders but you know the the consequences of uh, these actions uh, definitely transcend uh, these borders. So, but if I, if I, uh, well, your question is very broad. It's not very specific. So I guess when we talk about trade, uh, what kind of trade are we talking about? Are we talking about formal trade? Are we talking about informal trade? Are we talking about uh, trades that are legal going through the formal channels or, you know, or trades that are uh, going through the back? channel so all of this needs to be unpacked you know so uh but we have to look at this within the framework of globalization and how globalization is kind of like twofold on one hand it, it presents positive uh stuff whereby we can uh, gain access to other people's culture gain access to uh we can communicate 
to you know to someone from you know you can be anywhere in part of the world in africa and speak to someone or send money and the same way you can also be a victim of the same technology so so we can then again we look at um uh for instance look at what's happening in ukraine and and russia and look at how that affects uh, food insecurity creates food insecurity in Africa. We might be asking, why is that so? So all, all of this just opens up, you know, how what I call the paradox of uh, our contemporary world, where we, you know, can enjoy some of the benefits of all of this in integrated world, and then also uh, face the threat or constant threat of you know being a victim of, of, of this so that's what i say in in the absence of very specific questions that you've asked yeah i think for that very broad uh, response to that very broad question so uh mr melkanu i wonder why conflict in one country especially in africa tends to move into other countries could it be because you know of you know close border contact or it could, could it be because of some other reasons? Well, basically, why the conflict in one country moved to another country in Africa? Okay, uh, this is uh, an interesting question, I would say. And uh, as you rightly said, it conflict in Africa tends to cross to other countries' uh, borders and become uh, uh, a collective issue, a collective problem, rather than being a uh, single uh, um, country's uh, problems and issues. And uh, like you said, uh, one of the main issues I would say are the borders, right? So borders in Africa are oftentimes too porous. Uh, I'm not saying that they have to be strictly controlled. I mean, but they are too porous and they are too leaky. So, for instance, if you see uh, in Ethiopia, the majority of small arms and light weapons and their ammunitions are illegal most of the time and mainly enter uh, the country through three uh, three routes, actually. And uh, they are from Kenya, Sudan, and Somalia. And these arms have uh, played a huge role in the recent uh, conflict and insecurity that engulfed, uh, engulfed the country at an unprecedented levels, uh, which resulted in millions of uh, internally displaced persons. Uh, I remember at one time, uh, it was like three years ago, if, if I'm not mistaken, we were like the largest IDP uh, producing country. Uh, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, taking the rank from the, you know, Yemen, Syria, and countries and uh, borders are too porous and they are too leaky uh, so that you know insurgent groups uh, different illicit uh, uh, trade activities or other trades uh, can we seem to have a uh, connection problem with you uh mr malcano uh, for now we just segue to uh, dr wakba dr You're mute. Ibrahim, you're oh. mute. Oh, oh yeah. sorry. Well, yeah, sorry, Mr. Uh, Melkano. We seem to be having uh, some kind of problem with your connection. So for now- we'll... I was gonna follow up on what he was saying. Yes, I yes, I was gonna ask you about mute. the question on border. Uh, because you yeah, know, on the border. Point. Yeah, it's yeah. a controversial point. A lot of people will say, uh, well, borders are porous and we need to fix the border and make them stronger. A lot of people say, you know, that's not that's not an efficient market-oriented way of thinking. So what do you think about that, Dr. Wagner? Uh, in following up on what you say, like you need to understand the history of, of state creation in Africa itself. And look at that, that states were arbitrarily created and the borders uh, as they stand are uh, uh, no, um, so those borders are physical borders, but you see that, for instance, if you pick the Lake Chad, for instance, or if you even pick Ethiopia, that uh, 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 Eliza was talking about, you see that those places they have, you have people like in Eritrea, you have ethnicities, you have ethnic groups that transcend these physical borders. So you have uh, you have Somalians in Kenya, for instance, you have uh, you know Eritreans or people that share ethnic affinities to this group. So the borders themselves are not, don't really make much sense. They don't create any sense. So that, that is one, one end. So if you look at the Lake Chad, for instance, you look at the Boko Haram issue in the Lake Chad, you see that that border was 
you know, like Bokram lays claim to, you have ethnic groups like the Kanuris that, that live in, in Chad, that live in Meije and have families in, so they can easily, you know, transcend these, these borders. So we need to first talk about all those kind of um, uh, uh, dynamics. So that also comes into play when it comes to like transborder uh, um, crimes and the, the ease with which, you know, crimes, you know, move from one country to another because, you know, you know, these borders don't really, uh, they're not really effective from, from that functional uh, perspective. But, you know, back to what Lazar was saying, again, African governments don't have uh, the capacity to, or they've not shown the willingness or it might be a resource capacity issue to control that borders as well. And that, that, that is a, a big, a big, a big problem. A big problem. Right, so now let's, let's try and think about how trade could come, to, could come in here, maybe as a problem or as a solution. Because I, I, I mean, you know, a lot of scholars have argued that if you do not have good trade relations with, you know, between one country and another, or if, if good doesn't cross border soldiers will, or something in, in that regard, that trade is one way to uh, preserve transnational or cross border security. Uh, but we've seen, especially in the case of Boko Haram, that the countries affected, Chad, Niger, Nigeria, they are already intertwined in terms of trade. Then when Boko Haram can, 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 can buy and we try to you know, control the border, it also affected trade. So how do we navigate uh, or preserve trade relations or cross-border trade relations while also trying to address insecurity? Uh, I, will, I want to ask, okay, Maybe you can go back to you for a while. Back. Um, try it out. Um, to to be honest, trade the pro the one of the other problems as well also still goes back to our post colonial heritage, and also in the in the whole of Africa where we've relied so much on raw materials. So we we are like exporters of just raw materials rather than so there, there's very little trade going on within Africa itself. And, and I think that is what the uh, continental free trade and all of these initiatives are trying to, to, to correct. So in itself, trade in itself presents opportunity to, to um, for better relationship. But as, as it stands, there's, there's little, little trade going on. So I, I guess what you're saying is, in the case of the lecture, they share all of those four countries or five countries share a common resource, which is the Lake Chad Basin. So they get these guys, they're, they're mainly like fishermen, they are like uh, farmers, and the farmers get maybe water from, from this Lake Chad, and, and that becomes a common resource. So, but in terms of in terms of trade, there is there's little going on and the border trade is going going on. You don't have um, government influence or government reach in those border areas, it's very, it's very minimal. And then you have some of these uh, extremist Boko Haram controlling trade and economics and taking tax in those places. So it's also a case of governance as well. It's also a case of poor governance and, and also a case of like African, African governments are more interested in their rent seekers. So rather than, you know, interested in like creating trade where as they can tax and rely on tax, they're more like rent seekers. So, so we need to change that you know, that mentality before we can begin to see how trade can really, really create a positive relationship between between countries. Mm, got it. Okay, before we proceed, I, I'm going to bring in my colleague, Gary Zilwa, for he has a couple of questions. And in the, momentarily, we're trying to have uh, uh, Mr. Makara join us again. Uh, but before I go to Yarize, I want to restate that, you know, you in the audience can ask your question. All you need to do is raise your hand, but also have your questions ready. Uh, and it shouldn't take more than 20 seconds for you to ask a question. So for now, Arize, please go ahead. Hi. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Okay. Uh, my question is, let's continue from the, pressure, the, the, the issue about navigating trade or, or having soldiers cross. You have to choose one. So since we've chosen trade, my question is how does uh, free trade in Africa 
make the continent rather arduous or unsafe transportation of people. And those people may also offer services. So uh, their transportation and their goods, how does free trade in Africa make these people go across the borders safely? How, how does free trade make it safer and easier for them to carry out trade? I hope you got the question correctly, Dr. Walker. I think you're trying to ask uh, Arinze how um, how free trade um, can preserve security. Is that your question, Arinze? Yes. Yes. All right. Okay. Um. I I think basically, if I look at um, if I look at Europe, for instance, Europe used to be uh, a a continent that that was very troubled in the past they they you know where in conflicts constant wars and with each other then what european union has done is by then integrating their resources it's helped to to reduce the proclivity to towards conflict because they they now have you know they have a uh, common interest so when people have common interests and then they have the economics tied together it, it doesn't it doesn't make any so they have a shared interest in preserving peace so in africa currently one of the reasons why there's so much conflict is because you know we deal in silos so most of the uh, trade agreements that african countries have is is outside with outside with, with countries outside of the continent so there's no much stake in, in, in terms of um, within intra-trade uh, uh, activities. So by, you know, when you, when you, it's just like when you go into partnership with someone and you have a stake in it and you've put something in, you don't, you necessarily wouldn't want to sabotage, sabotage that, that project. So, but when you don't have too much stake in it, you know, you, you're more unwilling or concerned or concern about preserving or looking at the sources of that project. So the more connected we are in terms of trade and we have, you know, connected in terms of um, pulling resources together, uh, that, that will increase the chances of preserving, preserving peace. And uh, because, you know, you can, you can have development and progress in the absence of, of security. So, so because usually normally state in the international states you look at sovereignty people want to preserve that sovereignty so but what this trade that free trade does is you begin to have more more things that, that bond you together and when money when you have your money you know place if you're actually set up a business and your money is in there you're more interested in the sources of it so yes in that way free trade can um can um uh, help to facilitate that but you know there's, there's still challenges as well but yes free trade can help kind of in that in that way great sorry to interject Ariz. i want to come back to you uh but thanks for that response dr wapa uh, joseph uku zimana and our other friend joe Diga monongi uh, so you, got, you you probably need to you know, type your questions in english though i, I cannot read french through at this point so please type your questions in english and we'll be sure to ask uh, those questions. But we do have an anonymous question. But before we answer the anonymous question, uh, Mr. Melkano, we are just discussing why or how trade can be a solution to, to insecurity and how you know we can think about fostering cross-border trade to avoid uh, cross-border insecurity. Do you want to ask, do you want to add anything to, to, to what Dr. Wap already said, Mr. Melkano? or basically to, to re-ask the question, how can trade uh, be a solution to insecurity? Thank you. I was having uh, uh, an internet internet connection and sorry for that. Uh, it's actually a stinger uh, area to discuss. So uh, I believe that trade is one of the, I would say trade will give the continent of Africa no military options to deal with this, you know, insecurities. Uh, so I think free trade is a uh, paramount and important. Um, I mean, uh, aspect of uh, I mean, or aspect or issue that government or the regional economic countries in general should uh, focus on. And I say I say this because, uh, as you know, there is a, a 
uh, an African Peace and Security Architecture, which is basically composed of three different things, uh, conflict prevention, conflict management, and peace building. So this international trade uh, or free trade area will come, I would say, on the conflict prevention part of it. And uh, we can also discuss about the uh, development and security nexus here. And um, I say, uh, I, I also believe that these uh, economy issues are one of the main, uh, I mean, causes and drivers of insecurity in the continent. So, uh, free trade areas and increased uh, trades, I mean, within the continent will give the, I mean, the the, the continent another option to deal and to, I mean, solve these uh, uh, insecurities. Oh, okay, thank you. We have another most question, but before we answer that question, I'm going to have you answer it for us, uh, Doctor Wapa. Just want to state again, yeah. you can either. You can ask your question directly uh, by pasting it in the Q&A box, or you can raise your hand and we'll be sure to add you and you can ask the question uh, with your video on. So Dr. Wakwa, this person is actually asking a question about Boko Haram. They say, I wish to find out how exactly conflict and trade are connected. I think we already answered a little bit of that, but they ask further, away from the Boko Haram case, how can we generally correlate trade and conflict? Can you repeat that? The, the second part. They ask, how can we correlate trade and conflict? I think we asked that question oh, of the of the uh, of the program. But if you want to, you know, maybe help us understand yet again, why is it always uh, that when um, there is a case of transnational conflict? So, for example, let's take the Russia-Ukraine problem right now. You see that mm -hmm. when you know, Russia invaded Ukraine, trade was mm -hmm. uh, one of the key means of sanction that you know the West employed. Also in Sudan, mm -hmm. right now that the conflict is going on, we keep talking about how you know there's this smuggling of gold from from Sudan into Russia and the Wagner Group. Oh, yeah. So yeah, so again, the point is why do we always keep correlating trade with conflict? What's the, what's the obsession about it? Okay, from if if you look in the case of uh, the insurgents, they, you need money to fight to fight insurgents, and, uh, and it's almost like Boko Haram we we involved in in um in illegal activities, maybe you know like illegal attack or you know maybe it might be like transnational drug deal to be able to fund. For their their their, their activity. but in the case of Sudan and looking at I guess you're talking about the, the Wagner group, maybe Russia. So and you see Eastern uh, groups, community group, and then offering it could also be the the government. You know they're offering some sort of support to, to like fight of of like what's going on in in, in Sudan, and then they do that. And then get what they get return is the resources in in um in that country. They they get a, a stake of the resources in that in that country for providing military assistance to that to the country. So uh but yeah, that's from that could also be states, but also be state state actors, but this might be rogue state actors or in the legitimate uh state actors, not just is not just restricted to to, to like non state actors like Boko Haram, because have like a rogue state, you know, involving in, in those kind of. Um, so, for instance, if you look at the Gulf of Guinea, and you see when people, when the pirates hijack uh, oil, oil uh, ships, who do they sell it to? You know, they could sell it to rogue state like North Korea and all of that. So, yes, it's, it's quite interesting, unfortunately. But that's at my level. Oh, so, but we seem to be having. Uh, connection problem from your side. It, uh, maybe, so I, I think to solve the connection problem, another way to do it could be to deactivate cameras. So you only have, you know, the audio transmission. Uh, but uh, if if that is not solvable, or hopefully it's, it's gonna be solvable, but in the interim, I wanna bring in um, Arinze again. Uh, Arinze, do you have a question you wanna ask uh, the, the panelists? Yeah, uh, I have a question for Mr. Nekamu. 
it's about the uptime uh, uh, we we are still trying to get more countries to ratify the free trade agreement for the African continent. However, those that have already given their ratification, what assurances do you think that these countries have that free trade would not facilitate illegal arms trade or even the smuggling of drugs and uh, other banned items across their borders? Good question. Uh, Mr. Mercano, just to restate the question again, simply now that we are having AFCFTA opening this you know, cross-border trade, how are we be sure that we are not also opening the border to arms and you know, uh, weapons that could be causing conflicts as we've seen in Sudan? The microphone is muted, Mr. Mercano. The question is for me. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, I think the question is for you. Yeah, it's a, a good, a good question. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I was lost uh, in the middle of the discussion, and maybe my, uh, uh, I mean, colleague also maybe have raised the issue of governance here. So, uh, free trade uh, area in particular in the African continental free trade area in general is a huge opportunity for the African continent and the countries are like to like to 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 uh, uh, I mean uh, excel on their uh, economic aspects and uh, excelling in their economic uh, aspects will also be uh, uh, reflected in the political and the overall the uh, uh, I mean political or governance apparatus of states. So I would say uh, the free trade area or the AFCFT will have its own uh, negative things, but uh, if states manage to work on their uh, state apparatus and if they manage to build a strong, uh, uh, resilient government apparatus uh, from the policy aspect to the defense mechanisms, I think they can deal with these uh, issues of, you know, uh, the negative advantages of uh, free trade and the uh, accompanying, uh, I mean, illicit movement of drugs, uh, trafficking in humans, uh, and in even in uh, small arms and light weapons proliferation. So I would say governance has to be the main issue that the states and the regional economic communities alike should work and focus on, and uh, so that they will be able to. Uh, Best suit, uh, suited uh, and I mean placed to defend in the potential uh, negative uh, repercussions of uh, AF safety. Yeah. All right. Uh, thanks for your response. Uh, before we ask or we answer some of the questions in the in the Q and A box, there's a comment from Mambe Vivian. They say Africa is prepared in every aspect. I can't really tell why, despite all this, the level of trade can be compared with the European rich soil. In fact, everything that concerns agriculture. Uh, good comments. Dr. Nwakwa, if you are there, we would like for you to kindly help answer this question from Olukule Shobode. And they ask, mm. how important is cultural integration to trade integration? Uh, or is it irrelevant in today's globalized world? And they also ask, are there commonalities that can be leveraged to drive trade integration? Um, so if you, if you talk about cultural integration, so I'm, I'm guessing uh, in in Africa one of the one of the um, challenges in in you know establishing not necessarily establishing and having like an effective uh, continental free trade is the different regions have their own economic their own um, historical culture and they have their own um, uh, rec, what you call uh, regional economic um, communities, and whereby those those communities, like for instance, you have ECOWAS and you have uh, ECAS, the economy of Central African states, you have, you know, COMISA, you have all of these uh, different uh, systems, and then these systems have different uh, culture and different ideology and different um, histories, and there's been, it's been difficult to integrate all of this into into that one um, that single continental power. So yes, so having having on the side uh, a structure or an infrastructure that helps 
to bridge all of this cultural device would help to smooth things out. So for instance, if you look at, um, let me pick the Nigerian uh, music scene, for instance, or the Nigerian uh, movie scene. You see how it's caught across the region. And, you know, so that helps to people understand the culture, understands Nigerian music, understand Nigerian culture. And then again, in, in Nigeria, people are, people are listening to mu some music from Tanzania from these different places. So yes, as much as we're selling in economics, we also have to sell uh, uh, cultural, uh, all these cultural heritages. They need to, they need to integrate and blend. That's going to help, you know, in terms of like the trees. But that's a very good question. Yes, that's um, yes, that's very necessary. Oh well, no, thanks, Dr. Wafa. Uh, we will take another question from Nelson Owusu Utiamo and Mr. Melkamu, if you could kindly help us answer this question. It's quite a long question. And I think they're asking, how does the seemingly protected interests of diverse regional economic blocks in Africa, uh, like the Arab Maghreb Union, uh, the common market for Eastern and Southern Africa, the, you know, CENSAD, the EAC, the ECOWAS, and all that, how does this interest uh, promise to challenge or support the operationalization of the FCFTA? So I guess the question is, there, is an, there are existing um, cross national uh, trade blocks like ECOWAS, ECA, and whatnot. But they're asking, how does the AFCFTA fit into all this, or how does all this economic block fit into the AFCFTA? In other words, could there be some clash or could they complement one another? What do you think? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. And he rightly said it. I mean, dual or multiple um, presence of regional economic community and dual or multiple membership of African countries in these different you know, free trade areas or, uh, I mean, uh, economic communities is also one of the, uh, the, the, the one of the, the major problems that the FCFT is going to face. I mean, if you are a member of different, you know, uh, arrangements, economic communities or free trade areas, then it's expected that you are going to be binded by different laws, right? Different regulations. So it's going to create uh, a lot of problems. And like I said it earlier, I mean, one of the basic thing that if uh, if we went, we went if, if uh, the continent free trade area to be successful, we should uh, be able to deal with the governance issue. That's why I said it earlier. And the governance issue comes also here, so that we will have uniform trade policies, you know, trade regulations, even benefits, right? So we should focus on the uh, governance issue. That is the first thing. And the second thing is, I would say, these regional economies are the building blocks of the African Union in general, right? So we should you not know, take them as. Uh, you know, only as challenges or problems, right? Rather than, I mean, we should see them as opportunities. And, you know, uh, we, I mean, windows that we can use for the advancement of the economic, you know, aspiration that we want to, you know, you know, realize, right? So uh, we have to have this uh, excellent and, uh, I mean, basis with, you know, uh, um, governance or, I mean, I would say policies, regulations, and even benefits, and uh, we will be able to, you know, maneuver our way through this challenge, and we will be able to uh, implement this uh, TFTFT. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. There are several EU countries that are also members of the G6, G7, and G Infinity, and they, you know, they they have good relationship relationships across this different. Uh, partnership or multinational uh, corporations or organizations. So before I come back to you, Arize, I think we have a couple of hands raised. Uh, there's a comment, Karim, Karim Pakot Togo, I'm going to add you in a moment, but let me read this comment by Joel Barry, who they say, in my view, I think that political leadership in most of the African countries is a barrier to trade. Uh, agreed among most of our leaders until all African leaders unite. That's where common markets and maybe a common currency can boost trade in our region and on the other hand, compete with European superpowers in the future. 
Thanks for that comment, Joel. Uh, Karim, do you uh, do you want to ask your question now? I'm, I just added you to, to the floor. So you may ask your question, Karim. Think I'm uh, what is not on the, on the phone anyway. So we move on. Okay, um, we go to you, Arize. What's what other question you have? Yeah, thank you, Ibrahim. Oh, sorry, Arize. One second, I'll put it. I'm just Karim again. Karim, do you want to ask a question now? Okay, thank you very much, Anuba. Yes, I want to ask a question. Sorry, could you also okay, recently before you ask your question? Should I have indicated that? Uh, I am, you want me to introduce myself? Can you say that one more time? Where, you, where are you joining us from and what's your, uh, where do you work? I am Karim Akutobo. I am the National Coordinator of Students for Liberty in Burkina Faso. Okay, go ahead. Uh, my question is about uh, inflation. You know that uh, recently there have been inflation all over the world due to many crises, uh, mainly in Russia, again, Russia and Ukraine. So I would like to know if uh, there is a free trade among African countries, uh, how can that contribute to reduce inflation? Is it possible that free trade among African countries can contribute to reduce inflation in Africa? Okay, if I get your question correctly, uh, can free trade in Africa fix inflation problem? Yes. Okay. Because uh, I noticed that in most, in many, in many African countries, really people are suffering now because everything is really expensive. Okay. Well, well, thank you, thank you, Karen. So, Dr. Mwapa, do you want to help us uh, answer that question? Uh, inflation and free trade. Are there any correlation? Yes. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. So, so uh, in in Africa, like like um, if, uh, like I mentioned before, we do the trade balance between Africa and the rest of the world is uh, African African um, African countries. Are unfortunately, mostly rent seeking countries, and we we import more than we export. So, so this unfortunate situation means that. Uh, we mostly would have to pay high for things ordinarily like you know household things uh, that ordinarily we could we could produce so but with with free with the free trade that has been proposed within uh, I, I think one of the uh, one of the benefits of it is it, it's looking to shift a paradigm shift away from you know raw materials exportation to produce and stuff and then you know, reducing uh, tariffs that usually would make some of these products high. And, and that in itself will help in terms of uh, people having access to affordable goods and services. And this, this will help bring down, bring down the, the inflation. So yes, it, it, does, it does have an impact. If, if all of the structures, all of the infrastructures that helps to, to ease trade within Africa are put in place, Yes, we have a massive impact in, in you know, improving, uh, you know, the livelihood of, of people in Africa and reducing inflation. All right, thanks for that, Doc. Uh, Abdul Karim Mohammed, your question about cultural integration, we already uh, answered that. Dr. Mwakwa helped us answer that question. Um, there's a comment from, okay, before we go to the comment from Roshana, thanks for translating that question from, uh, Jeroboam Glenboya. So Jeroboam, we we only host this webinar in English for now. Hopefully, we can have the capacity to to do it in French as well. Uh, but your question about Boko Haram, I think you've already answered that. So thank you and thanks for bringing that up, Glenn. So Rosana Chindumba has a comment. They say there is a campaign going on, known as Borderless Africa, meaning people within Africa will be free to move and trade from one country to another. So my question is. How would this affect trade and economy? Okay, well, maybe we can you know, infuse that into a larger question. Uh, and maybe Mr. Nelkamu, you want to help us answer this question? 
So trade and the economy, we've seen many African countries, apart from ratifying the FCFTA, they've you know, engaged in new bilateral trade, bilateral trade relations and trade agreements with other African countries and even countries outside of Africa. However, this has not translated into economic development or our economic progression uh, over the years. And I don't know too much about Ethiopia, but I know Ethiopia recently also uh, fixed its uh, problem with Eritrea and other neighboring countries. But Mr. Melkamu, do you think uh, free trade agreements often have consequence on the economic uh, out, out, outlook of the country, or if not, why so? Can you repeat the question, please, Brian? Yes, I think that the person want to know the correlation between free trade and the economy. Does a country agree into, agreeing to implement a free trade policy, does that necessarily mean that country will have a better economy down the line? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I believe so. I mean, if you have, uh, uh, I mean, a trade relation or, uh, I mean, some kind of agreement with uh, uh, other countries, it, it means increased trade with that country, right? So if there is an increased trade, trade, trade activity or other kind of economic activities, then it will end up, you know, being in an economic ad advancement, right? In economic, right? So uh, free trade area or trade agreement, it could be bilateral or multilateral. Uh, whatever the case, it will be reflected in the overall economic uh, figures of a country. So I believe that uh, you know trade relations and trade areas in general will have a positive impact on the uh, economics of economies of uh, countries. Thank you for that. So uh, we will bring it to a close with a question from Arinze, which will be answered by Dr. Mwapa. But before we do that, yes, Glenn, uh, the recording should be available later on YouTube in the next coming days. Uh, so thanks for that question. So Arinze, uh, final question for Dr. Mwapa, we, we call it. Uh, uh, Dr. I want to ask, what should be the markers to convince Africans, everyday Africans, that free trade has made Africa safer? What should we look out for? know that this is now safe. Um, well, I, I, I think there are, I think to be honest, it's, uh, I think we're talking in terms of aspiration now, because when you talk about free trade, I think free trade should be seen within the content of, context of uh, the African agenda 2063. And this is, uh, this should be seen within that within that context. So it's not just uh, within a period. So it's something that that goes with is a fifty year plan. And now when I talk about uh, um, it, should be seen within that broader framework of creating an inclusive uh, uh, um, um, government. So, but if you look at the marker, if you're talking hypothetically, so we're looking at a situation where people's livelihood. Uh, is generally improved. People can have uh, access to, to, you know, the basic. So you can look at, for, for instance, I, I don't want to look at um, those kind of like macro measures where people look at, you know, GDP increase. So those are still at the state level. So you have to look at it from the human security level, where people, where people's day-to-day -day, uh, economic uh, uh, um, situation is improved. People can have access to food. Uh, people can have access to the basic things, that, and and then again, we could look at insecurity. People can have uh, better um, security and protection, and then we'll start seeing less uh, IDP camps and less uh, disruption within. You have to see a reduction in in internal uh, what is it called displacement. That would be one marker to, to look at it. You see improved people's day-to-day -day, uh, uh, livelihood. And then you see also improvement in, um, you see improvement in, um, uh, so you're talking about the ordinary people. You see where people can have access across borders. You can have free movement, you know, free movement of, of goods and services and, you know, without, fear of being a, a victim of uh, 
of um, all, the, all, the, all this kind of all this kind of crap. They see less less conflict in the region. So this 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 is the market that the the, the free trade is is, is working. Uh, this would this would be some of the obvious markets. Up, up, definitely there will be some other markets. That this would be some of the you know apparent ones uh, to, to to look at for. Because again, we are seeing that in the continent of Africa, Africa has like the youngest. Um, the youth population is very. You, you have the largest youth population in the in, in the world, and you have the youth unemployment is very very large. So you need to be seeing again uh, more youth employed, and uh, that will be also another market to 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 look at to look at for it to be, yeah, employment rate of employment unemployment will reduce, uh, rate of poverty will reduce, uh, conflict will reduce. And yeah, so this 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 would be some of the markets to look at for. Well noted. Thank you. Uh, so we that's the most we can take for for, for today. I apologize for kind of take your questions. I've got those moving and uh, I apologize for the video to the panel.